good starting point is to know God's will for your life. You've got to know God. And that means you need to get in His Word every day. There's absolutely no substitute. Hello and welcome to Candid, where we never settle for less than the truth. I'm your host, Jonathan Youssef. Each week, we'll tackle tough issues, answer your hard questions, and take a candid look at the Christian faith. Today's conversation is all about purpose, calling, and aligning ourselves with God's will for our lives. The age-old adage says, a calling is given to the called by a caller. But what does that mean? How do we identify our purpose? And most importantly, how do we teach these values to young adults who are on the brink of life-defining decisions? Our guest today, Aaron Forrest Johnson, brings a unique blend of experience as a founding principal of the executive recruiting firm Forrest Johnson Consulting, her hands-on training as a mother of four, and her incredible zeal for discipleship. Erin has not only lived her calling, but has also written a comprehensive guide titled The Caller, The Called, The Calling, which is an excellent resource for teenagers, college students, young adults, and even their mentors. This book, woven with scriptural insights over a span of 100 days, seeks to provide a much-needed biblical perspective on career choices and the larger role we all play in the redemptive narrative. Whether you are a young adult seeking direction, a mentor guiding someone, or simply curious about life's purpose and calling, today's episode is just for you. Well, today my guest is a good friend and member of our church, Aaron Johnson. Aaron has written a new book called The Caller, The Called, and The Calling. And uh, it's a very intriguing title. I want us to get into that. But before we get into the topic of calling, which is vast and broad, I wonder, Aaron, if you would just take a minute and tell us a bit about yourself, your family, your vocation, as well as uh, your work, life, all these sorts of things. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. It's so great to be on this podcast with you, and um, I appreciate you uh, having me here. So I am a mother of four. I am a business owner with my husband, Mm -hmm. um, which usually gets a lot of questions because we literally (laughs) own and work together, and uh, we homeschooled our kids for 10 years while doing all of these things. So, But our, our children are now between the ages of 11 and 17. Mm -hmm. Um, Our oldest is a rising junior in high school. And uh, because of their ages, I'm I'm sure that will feed into the purpose of the book that I've written. Um, But we've been a member of the Church of the Apostles now for 17 years, if you can believe it. So we've literally raised our family Mm. um, there in the community of the Church of the Apostles and um, love the work of the church and are very involved there in the student ministry and the women's ministry and a lot of different things over the years. So it's a very small snapshot of our life. Well, and you and your husband, Drew, have been very involved with Colson Fellows, which uh, does meet here on our campus. And tell us a little bit about Colson Fellows. Well, um, that's right. My husband is the volunteer director of um, the Colson Fellows program in Atlanta. So it's a it's a cohort that meets in person once a month and goes through a year long program that um, helps you understand your faith more deeply and love the Lord with your mind as well as your um, heart, soul, and strength. And um, it's an incredible, incredible program that is um, very intentionally guides you not just towards deeper levels of learning and deeper understanding of the Lord, but how to apply that very practically to your life and to the spheres of influence that God has given to you so that you can be a part of bringing the Mm. kingdom of God in the here and now Mm. um, and uh, being a part of his work in the world. So um, interestingly, again, the book that I wrote is a part of the outworking of a three-year plan that they ask you to put together as a part of um, your participation in the Colson Fellows Program. Um, So they ask you to to consider, you you think through that the gifts that God has given you, the aptitudes and strengths that you have, um, the communities, the spheres of influence influence that you are in and, you know, how do you be a part of the work that he is doing in the world through 
who you are and where he has you. Yeah. And so this yeah. is kind of a, a little bit of what I'll call not a culmination, but the beginnings. Yeah. Of, it's sort of the um, connective tissue here, yeah, isn't that's it? Right. Okay. Calling. So let's get the ball rolling on that. I mean, it's, it's such a big topic. We see it everywhere. We, you know, everybody's talking about it to some degree, especially in Christian spheres. Why don't you walk us through sort of the early stages of, of unpacking all of this? Yeah, Jonathan, it is a huge, huge topic. And the reality is calling is something that is central to being human. Hmm. Because we're made in the image of God, know that we are made on purpose. We're mm. made for a purpose. We're made with a purpose. And you see some, one of the deepest longings of the human soul is to have purpose. You see this a lot with the current generation mm -hmm. that is becoming adults. So Gen Z, so many of them are so beautifully desiring to be involved with a purposeful work. Um, you see a lot of people standing up for causes. We've seen yeah. that you know, good, bad, and ugly, you know, uh, yeah. during and, and after yeah. COVID. That's right. Yeah. We see so many um, deep longings of the human soul taking shape through this desire for meaning. Yeah. So I think that's something that's really important for all of us to recognize is that's part of who God made us to be. And as people of God, we know that that's very intimately connected with the person of God. So when we think about the topic of calling, I think the most important first thing that we are called and that we have a caller. Yeah. And so you can't have a conversation about calling, about purpose, about meaning without actually rooting that foundationally first mm. in God. It's source. Yeah. So, you know, in theology, we talk about the two callings. There's the outward call, which goes to everyone repent, believe, hear the gospel, etc. That goes to believers and non-believers alike. Then there's the effectual call, which is sort of the inward working of the spirit in the life of a believer. You know, some people call it effectual calling or the irresistible grace that when the spirit works in the life of the person and opens their spiritual eyes, they really have to respond to it and then faith is given. So it's this sort of monergistic view that it's the active work of God in the life of a person. So when you're writing this, is it under the banner of the effectual call for those who have been called to the Lord Jesus Christ and are beginning to show fruit and, and trust and faith? Or is this sort of still part of a, a general call to all people outward call? That's a great question. With the book itself, um, which is called The Caller, The Called, The Calling, a 100-Day Guide to Understanding Purpose, the book was very specifically written with an audience in mind that, um, honestly, th there's, there's a, a little bit of a vacancy on materials of this topic. There, there's a lot for adults out there. You can read mm -hmm. incredible books like um, Oz Guinness has an, a, a great work called The Call. Yeah. Um, and, and there's so many books even that are very practical for people who are already working and trying to figure out. Um, you know, Tim Keller has a, has a huge and an incredible um, work on, um, on work. <laughs> yeah. So this book was um, specifically oriented towards a young Younger audience and okay. young, I don't mean children. What I mean sure. is um, older high schoolers, college age, and young adults who are really trying to understand who they are and what they were made to do and how do I figure this out. Yeah. And so, with that in mind, I wrote this book very specifically with that person in mind. So, mm. it is not necessarily trying to replace any of the great works that are out there that really go deeply into the theology of work, the theology of calling. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very practical to say, okay, if before we can even talk about these subjects, um, you need to know the voice of your caller. You, we, mm -hmm. we need to talk about some very foundational things about who you are as defined by the person that made you, that those two things cannot be extracted one from the other. Yeah, yeah. And so I wrote it, primarily with the Christian in mind, right. um, but also uh, trying to point out for people who may not be there yet, who may be um, involved in a church, but 
don't really have a solid understanding of what it means yeah, to be yeah. a Christian. We yeah. actually do talk about that in the book. You know, what yeah. what is a Christian? You know, this is something that we need to discuss before we dive deeply into who God is. Um, you know, what 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 does it even mean to be faith? Why is faith important? Mm-hmm. Why are we even addressing these topics in this mm-hmm. order before we just jump straight into, hey, what should I choose as a major? Or what what do I <laughs> where do I go now that I've graduated and I've got to find a job and my yeah. degrees in English? Like what do yeah. I do with that? Yeah. Before there we talk no about jobs. what we do, yeah, it's it's who we are and who he is and why. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. So I have this question that sort of came into my mind when we were talking about calling, and it's this idea of I think that older generations kind of scoff at the idea of, you know, the uniqueness of the calling, and it feels kind of individualistic, and you think you're a unicorn, and it's all about you, and versus like, hey, you know, whatever happened to just getting a job and working and having a family, but I think the way you worded it was really helpful, which is that the younger generation is elevating this concept, and this is Christian and non-Christian alike, this whole kind of like advocacy and purpose and meaning and this sort of thing. It's obviously highly important to, I'm guessing, according to your research, that sort of uh is a Gen Z is sort of the the generation that's promoting all of this. Those are biblical concepts that can be overemphasized at times, but maybe for generations have been underemphasized and underutilized. So can you kind of walk us through a little bit of that in terms of what you've seen from a generational standpoint in terms of like some of the strengths that are coming out of that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think what you're referring to is the um, the research, and some of this comes from Barna and Impact 360. They've done a couple of big research projects specifically on Gen Z. And uh, one of the things that they found is that this generation especially is very connected to causal Mm-hmm. Um, jobs and involvements. And um, it, it's really beautiful. And that applies across the generation. It doesn't matter um, where you live or where you're from or your socioeconomic status. It's just um, part and parcel of who this generation is. And um, a lot of them take up causes like clean water, you know, in, in various right. places of the world or um, climate change is a really big one, um, you know, for this generation and, and topics like that. And um, But the thing that I think that we can all agree upon, and this is something that John Stone Street um, at Colson Center says a lot, all truth is God's truth. Mm-hmm. And so I think what we're seeing in this is that the connection to meaning, to purpose, to stewarding the world, yeah. you know, these mm-hmm. are all very beautiful biblical concepts yeah. that are, you know, there's a cultural mandate in Genesis to mm-hmm. you know, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, rule it, subdue it. That's exactly what God has called us to. And so I think that there's something in this that we can all learn from this generation to embrace and to champion that these are wonderful and good things. And I think connecting that to the other piece of the question that I think that you asked, which is, you know, maybe sometimes we overemphasize self, you know, when it comes to work and and wanting to feel like I'm connected, that I matter, that and kind of the center of these conversations around um, work and wanting to do something that I enjoy. And, and we do see some of that at play right now in hiring. So I, I didn't mention this earlier, the work that my husband and I do with the business that we own is executive recruiting. So I've been involved for, um, you know, don't tell anybody, but over 20 years now in the executive search world where I'm helping companies find very specific people that they need to hire into their organizations. Yeah. And, you started when um, you were five. I did. Can you believe it? I was just this um, incredible, like miracle child. (laughs) But it's been such a joy and a pleasure to do that job. And and I see now looking back, you know, 20 plus years into my career, how, you know, God really did make me very specifically for the work that he's given me to do. Mm. And um, I won't go into the the details of that. We can if you'd like. But um, but I think that we can all look at that and say, okay, how did God wire me? I'm sure, you know, a lot of uh, accountants in the world who are super extroverted people, but it is not the traditional thing to say, okay, you're going to sit in front of a computer all day 
be happy in your work when you'd rather be out socializing and talking to people and, and, and thing, interviewing people like I do. And um, so, so we see that the, the work that God's given us to do, he gives us skills, he gives us interests, he gives us passions, he gives us equipping. And um, that's, again, a, a really beautiful and wonderful thing. I pulled out a verse, Jonathan, that's honestly one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And y'all might think I'm crazy because it's in Exodus. You know, most people's favorite verses or life verses are in um, the New Testament or in Psalms. And, and mine's, you know, part of the Exodus and the wanderings in the desert. But um, it's in Exodus 35 when um, God talks to Moses and then Moses and says to the people of Israel, starting in verse 30, see, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God, yeah. with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship. craftsmanship yeah. And mm. the point is, verse 32, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood and for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Oholiab, the son of, I can't say this word, you probably could, um, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer. And it goes on and on and on. And he has very specifically given these men skills and intelligence and purpose and then he's filled them and inspired them. And I think we can kind of glean from this or infer that he's also given them experience mm. to design the temple. Yeah. Their job is to create the temple of the Lord. Yeah. And, and I think that's such a great example. I mean, you don't really see elsewhere in scripture that uh, maybe Paul, when he's talking about, you know, his experience and all the things that he could take pride in. But we see here that God's given all of this to a jeweler, a designer, yeah. an artist yeah. for a very specific work that God has called him by name to do. Mm. And I do think that's egocentric to say, hey, God's given me these things for a very specific purpose and work. All of these things are obviously submitted to the Lord in service to him and for his glory. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about in that passage because I, you know, I remember reading that and thinking, you know, even God called and equipped people to do the work for the building of his temple. And you read, you know, sometimes people get lost in those details of how big it was and the dimensions and the the elements that were being used. And But they were all for a purpose. And so we kind of get to this idea of like uh, fulfillment, like a, a feeling of fulfillment. I remember Carl Truman in one of his books talked about, you know, if you asked my grandfather if he was fulfilled in his work, he would be confused by the question. You know, he would have seen work as just what you do to earn a living, to do, you know, what you do when feed your family and take care of people. Um, and he was saying this is kind of a more modern concept, which, as we've just pointed out, is actually an old concept, which is maybe being revived. So, you know, can we talk a little bit about fulfillment and, and, you know, should it, does the individual, should they be looking for fulfillment in their, for lack of a better word, vocation, though I know some people will argue the word vocation, it means ministry, but anyway, um, mm -hmm. should that be our goal or is that just sometimes a byproduct of, of what comes out of what we do? That's a great, great question, Jonathan. I think it's a byproduct of what we do. I think what, again, going back to the question of calling, um, I think that, you know, fulfillment and pleasure, joy, happiness, maybe not joy, we can talk about the nuances of that word, but these are fruit. Those are the fruit of a life that is lived wholly surrendered to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And our first calling, I think we would all agree to this, our first calling is to know God, to make him known and to enjoy him. Yeah. And uh, you know, over and over and over, it kind of baked around the passage that we just read yes. is the Lord saying that he is God and, and who he is. And we uh, over and over and over, it's 
love the Lord your God, obey me, cling to me, hold fast to me. Those are the things that are emphasized far more than um, fulfillment. And honestly, we, d- we don't see in this passage necessarily him saying anything to right. Bezalel about, um, you know, you are going to love every minute of this work that I've given you to do, you know, because yeah. the reality is we live in a broken world. Maybe yeah. in the... Um, and the restoration of all things and in right. their consummation, It'll have its work will be glorious yeah. all the time. Right. right? But, but right. right now, um, and, and again, we, we have to pause here as well mm. and recognize that work is a pre-fall gift yeah. to humanity. Mm. 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 We can also point out Genesis 12, where God says that he's going to bless Abraham, but it's not a blessing for the purpose of him simply enjoying his life. Yeah. You know, he said, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing to the um, nations. This, yeah, that's right. Right. That's right. So that, um, I, I think is, is a far more important reality. And, and again, all of life is to be lived in submission to whatever it is that God calls us to. And, and um, sometimes we will have great joy. I love my job. I tell people yeah. all the time, I am a kid in a candy store interviewing people all day long, you know, helping them connect to You positions. don't strike me as a people person. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't like to talk at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but I love what I do, but it's hard. Yeah. It is really hard. And I'm exhausted at yeah. the end of most days. And um, not every year has been easy. Um, not every position or client is easy to work with. Um, work is hard. And so enjoyment will come and go. It's like the, the old crew train in the uh, four spiritual laws where you have fact, faith, feeling, right? Feeling comes at the end. Mm. feelings come and go in our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we feel close. Sometimes we don't. Those things are temporary and not the goal. Yeah. Um, The goal is a life lived in glory to God Mm. and in alignment with his purposes and the work that he's given us in this time, in this place, in our community and for the glory of God and the life of the world. I think the reason, so I bring up the fulfillment aspect because I think that's the language that I hear most often, friends, colleagues, younger people who will quit a job because they just say, yeah, I'm just not feeling fulfilled. And I think that's kind of what we were talking about earlier. Like, you know, in terms of trying to find purpose, I think that's how we can kind of get off the tracks when all we're looking for is fulfillment from a profession, a vocation, whatever, because really your, your fulfillment has to be God. And then he provides work for you to do. But if you're trying to find fulfillment in the work, you're going to feel unfulfilled (laughs) for lack (laughs) of better term. Um, So I think that's really important. And I don't want people to think that getting your book is like, oh, this will help me find the thing that will fulfill me, which in some ways it will, and we'll we'll come to this now, which is coming back to the first point, which is getting to know the caller. You know, you answer it beautifully in the book, but I wonder if you could take a minute and answer it now for our listeners. How do you learn to discern God's voice, his will, and his purpose? I think that's a question that people really kind of maybe get to at the at the very front end, right? Right, right. I'm so glad you asked that question. The reason that this book even came about is because I'm helping to build the guidance counseling program at my kids' school. We're graduating mm-hmm. our first seniors this year and um, this right. coming school year. So in 2024, they will graduate. And um, so we're building. We're, we're building a lot of the structures that other schools already have in place. And what I'll call guidance counseling, I think, is more aptly defined as vocational stewardship or vocational um, discipleship. And after the end of an event that we had, where we brought in a series of speakers to talk about this subject, the caller, the called, and the calling, um, one of the fathers walked up to me afterwards. His daughter asked him a question at some point during the event and, and said, Dad, how do I know the difference between my will and God's will? And I was like, man, that is, that is so good. You know, for this, 15 year old girl to be asking this question. It's mm-hmm. just incredible. So he said, Aaron, we had a, you know, resource table, actually two, just filled with incredible books for, you know, parents and students to browse and, and select from for reading. And um, he said, which of these books, if I wanted to read one with my daughter to answer that question, which of these books would you guide me towards? 
<laughs> after looking at these incredible books, I honestly, I, I stopped myself and I said, you know, Michael, none of them, none of them, your daughter needs to read the word to, in order mm. to know the caller yeah, and to discern, discern his yeah. will, you have to discern his voice, which means that you need to know him. Yeah. And so that was really what led me, okay, you know, are there scriptures? So what does the scripture say? If if students in high school or college or young adults or honestly anybody, any of us guiding students towards these major life decisions, if we are looking to understand what God has made us for um, in doing that, seek out who he is and learn to hear his voice, we have got to be in the word. So the book is 100 different scripture passages for people to study Mm -hmm. that very specifically address who God is, the caller, who we are as the called, and then what is calling as the Bible defines calling. Mm -hmm. And so that's the whole reason that this book was created. And so that's the starting point is to know God's will for your life. You've got to know God. And that means you need to get in his word every day. There's absolutely no substitute. In fact, we see in um, Deuteronomy again, you know, at this point, I love the Old Testament. I I think Deuteronomy 10 verse 12 gives us a very clear explanation. It says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. That's where it all begins is knowing him, knowing his word. And as you listen to him and begin to recognize his voice, just like in the book, I, I use the example of you know, a, a, a somebody, you know, walking up the stairs, whether it's you know a roommate or a parent or a sibling. I used to lie in bed at night as a child and I would think to myself, there's my dad. He's coming to say goodnight to me because I knew his footsteps. And I think it's very similar in our walk with the Lord. We know the prodding of the spirit. We learn to recognize his voice and when he is leading and guiding us. So that's where it all begins. And then once we have that, and we never reach the end of that, right? We're we're always um, on the, the great fantastic journey and quest of knowing him more deeply. Um, But as we do that, we can layer onto that um, other elements to understand the work that he's given us personally to do. And um, the way that we like to frame that up or or that I like to frame that up when I'm talking to people is through four different areas. Um, If you think about a Venn diagram and overlapping circles, um, one of those are um, strengths, gifts, aptitudes that he has gifted you with uniquely. That's kind of yeah. who you are and how you steward those. Um, another one is your interests. Um, you're going to be naturally interested in some things and not interested in other things. You could be um, really yeah. great at soccer, but if you love baseball, that's going to guide where you spend your time. So, so there's interests that overlap on top of that. And then there's also this um, circle of opportunity. Some doors open, some doors don't open. Um, when I was graduating college, um, one I had two different majors. One of them was music. And I was just convinced that I was going to be um, somebody you listen to on the radio, not on a podcast, but, you know, because I had music and that is, those doors did not open for me. You know, that was not God's will for me. So, yeah. so the opportunities is another circle in that overlapping Venn diagram. And then if you think about um, a circle that encapsulates the whole thing, like arms hugging all of it is relationships. Because so much Mm. of who you are are the communities that you're involved in, the people that you know, those open doors, those, you know, develop gifts and experiences and um, hone aptitudes. And um, so so relationships is an encapsulating circle that applies to all of those different areas. But really where those things overlap is what we could define as the work that God's given you to do or or the call that he's placed on your life. And that is, can be applied to a number of different things, right? Somebody who's great with numbers could go into commercial real estate. They could go into investment banking. They could become a professor of math. They could be in physics. You know, there's a lot of different applications to what you're calling or work could be. And so that's where I think many of us see over time, um, 
shifting careers, right? Or, um, you know, second career for some people, yeah. or um, even applying those gifts to volunteer areas in addition to, you know, the work that you're doing in a nine to five type of a job. So that can change and shift. And that's where you just lean into what the Lord um, may have for you. But it all begins with knowing God and knowing his voice. And again, not just knowing it, but submitting yourself to that voice and to whatever he tells you to do. Yeah. Just in hearing you describe some of those, um, you know, in terms of opportunities and giftings and all this, you know, a lot of it has to do with access. You know, some people are going to have a, a very full chart to use your illustration that you've given. Um, some people aren't going to have access to near as much. How do you coach the person who maybe doesn't have a lot of relationships, maybe doesn't score high on personality tests or whatever? And, you know, I mean, there's nothing too small to start with, I'm, I'm guessing, right? That's a great point, Jonathan. Um, I, I think it's easy. We, we are products um, in America of um, Western thinking. And um, uh, Tim Keller points out in um, his book, Every Good Endeavor, that the idea of some jobs being better, quote unquote, than other jobs actually comes from Plato. That does not come from the Bible. The Bible doesn't say you are more of a person, you are more human because you work at a desk, right. wear a collar and a tie, and um, make more money. Right. And that makes you more yeah. human than somebody who is, you know, driving an Uber or car. Or, yeah. And yeah. um, those ideas are not scriptural. And so for people who have the means to go to college, for people who don't have the means or interest, you know, for, for going to college, maybe um, as, as Kathy Cook might say, you are um, body smart. You're not book smart. You know, so um, and, and yeah. she has a wonderful book called The Eight Great Smarts. And that, and that every God's gifted everybody. Everybody is smart. Yeah. It, we're just not all smart in the same way. And so with the, the means, the background, the opportunities, the relationships, the skills and abilities that he's given you, the work that he gives you to do is just as wonderful and valid and needed in our world. The, the farmer is as important as the person working in an hourly job at the grocery store. Those are all yeah. meaningful to our world and all good. They, they are all stewarding and cultivating yeah. um human relationships, our relationship with the world um, and, and stewarding the earth, um, all of those are needed and just as valid. Yeah. And if college tuition rates keep rising as they are, <laughs> yes. none of us will be able <laughs> <Yes>. to afford it. <laughs> this book is clearly geared towards, as you said, the sort of teenager, young adult kind of age category what about for parents who are trying to help, whether it's raising little ones or raising older ones through through these things? You know, what sort of advice do you give them? How do they not just help with the purpose mm -hmm. aspect? I think sometimes we set our eyes on the end goal or the outcomes and we miss the steps in the process. So, like, what do you recommend for parents as they are raising their children you know, to eventually come to those ends? Great question. Um, I think that one of the most important roles of a parent besides discipling their children, right? We can't ignore that. And I, and I think we talked about that, but um, one of the most important things that a parent can do is recognize in their children, their interests, their gifts. Mm. Um, I'll use my oldest as an example from the earliest age. It was the craziest thing. He fastidiously colored within the lines, um, which is, is a funny little thing to recognize in a child. Um, but he would not go outside lines. He'd be two Ooh. years old, very carefully. Rule follower. I mean, yes, a rule follower. A, a police officer We can also say he's highly detailed um, yeah. and he enjoys beauty. Like he saw the mess. Yeah. He didn't want mess. And, um, you know, combine that with, um, this is a funny story from, from him when he was a little um, boy, he, we got him one of those little ride on cars that you could zoom on, you know, all over the house. He never got on that car. What he would do is he would turn the car upside down get out his toy tools and pretend to fix it. He would turn the wheel and see what happened, um, the steering wheel and look at what happened to the wheels and how they would pivot. He was taking apart toys at 
six months old, you know, trying to figure out how they work. My An next engineer son, like his dad. yes, my next son was born and never thought to do that. Got on the car, started running around um, all over the house. And literally you could see the light bulb go off in my oldest I mean, his eyes sparked up like, that's what you do with this? <laughs> and it just never crossed his mind. And then he started writing on this car. Well, flash forward, and he's 17. So he is still in the process of becoming, right, and learning himself. He wants to be an architect. He yeah. loves designing. He loves yeah. beautiful things. Order. He loves order. Yeah. He still makes these incredible detailed models of buildings and um, you, you see that from a very early age and how that takes shape. So I think one of the things that parents can do is, is lean into the personality of your child, take note of the things that they are drawn to, that they dislike. Um, and I would, again, strongly encourage everybody to look into Kathy Cook's books. She is um, a phenomenal writer and she, um, her book, Eight Great Smarts, and she has several others at this point, help parents to see the giftedness of their child and the unique abilities and proclivities that each one of them have mm. so that when they're older, you can help them have these conversations. Because a lot of times, I'm, I'm sure we could all share stories of how we had to learn to recognize things in ourselves. Mm. Like I, yeah. I, I would not have been able to tell you in high school or college that I'm an extreme extrovert. I wouldn't have been able to use those words. Yeah. But through personality tests, through other people speaking into my life, they recognized this. And that helped put me on a path to a work that I truly love. And yeah. um, so I think the more that parents can recognize these things, speak them into their child and help them recognize it in themselves, that's a huge gift that they could give them to understanding the work that God will have for them one day. In your book, you mentioned catechism. Can you help us fit that into the whole calling aspect and how that art is, sort of plays out? Yes. Yes. Oh, I love that. I'm, glad, I'm so glad you asked this question. So catechism is something that we're very familiar with in the church, right? Where we mm. have the Westminster um, yeah, Shorter Catechism. And we're familiar with that word. It, it feels like a churchy word. The reality is the history of catechism comes from, again, Western civilization, Greek and Roman education. Yeah. And they use that as an educational tool in the repetition of words to form habits, to teach. Um, it was a little bit of rote memorization, yeah. but it was a forming tool in the lives of students. And I pointed out in the book because um, we need to recognize the power of repetition and things that we allow as voices into our lives. So connecting that to today, you know, beyond kind of recognizing catechism in children, which, you know, at least at Church of the Apostles, um, our children's director challenges us to have our kids memorize the entire children's catechism. Yeah. Um, you know, as a way to help them have those resources to rely on yes. as, a, as foundational truths in their walk with the Lord. But that applies to all of us in, in other ways as well. The, the power of catechism is that it's shaping. Mm. Catechism shapes who we are. Yeah. And so with all of us, you think about the things that shape us, the things that we repeatedly do, that we repeatedly listen to, those voices shape who we become. So um, I, I ask in the book, think about the songs that you're listening to. Yeah. Um, songs are, are things that we hear over and over and over. We sing the lyrics tens, if not hundreds of times over the course of a lifetime. And those shape who you are. News channels that we listen to shape conversations that we have. Mm. It's the voices, it's, it's the people we hang out with every yeah. day, you know, whether they're um, colleagues or um, the closest friends. I mean, it's okay to be um, friends with a whole uh wide variety. In fact, I would say that's biblical, right? That's how we have influence on people, but the people that are closest to us, um, you know, it goes with the concept of don't be un unequally yoked. We want yeah. our closest friends that we spend the majority of our time with to be people who are all walking towards the Lord. And so we have to be very, very careful when, again, applying that to the concept of calling, it's not just what we do with the work that we're given or the um, 
uh, volunteer time that we have outside of the working hours, but it's a broader concept of who are we becoming? Mm. Um, we are not just called. We don't just apply calling to our work. We apply calling more broadly to the person that we're becoming in all of our lives, the um, husband and father or the wife and mother that you will one day become and um, the stewarding of relationships that you have in your lives. It's your involvement in the church and in how you are pouring into the lives of other people, your involvement in your neighborhood, all of these mm. um, are relationships and roles that we are called to as a whole person. So the shaping power of catechism is, again, broader than... Um, Again, what we use and applying that in the Christian world, um, but also it's, it's all the voices that are shaping who we become. Yeah. Um, so all, all of that needs to be carefully managed by all of us and, and, and parents, especially thinking about, you know, video games or music or yeah. podcasts or Exposure, friendships. Yeah. All of those shape who we are. As it relates to the book, how do you recommend people read this? Is it sort of like, uh, Read on an individual level, read with a group. What sort of, if you had a format that you would recommend? I would recommend doing it in community. Yeah. I think that if one or multiple parents, you know, if you have, um, not everybody has a, a, both a mom and a dad in their lives, but but I think that it's, it's with parents and children together. Yeah. That is the best case scenario. You know, honestly, there's very few things I think that God calls us to do by ourselves. You know, the power of community is um, really important. And again, back to the, the conversation of shaping. Yes. So I would encourage um, parents to read it with children. I would also encourage if, if you're older than that, you don't want to read it with your parent. I totally get, I would apply that maybe towards high school, but yeah. if you are college um, age, you can do it with a small group. Um, I would encourage everybody to, um, no matter what age and stage you are, to invite mentors into your life and um, people who are trusted that you can bounce ideas off of, that you can um, make important decisions with their input and counsel and advice. But I think the best thing would be for people to read this in community with one another. And um, but, but a lot of the actual work of the book, again, it's scripture. Uh, it, there, there's, there's kind of the first few pages that help orient us towards the concepts that we're talking about. And then it's 100 days into scripture. So a lot of that work is going to be individual, of course. Yeah. Um, but getting together with people to talk through this and how do I apply this and what do you think of this? Um, that's where I think it can really take on new power and dynamic. Mm. Well, even apart from finding your purpose within a calling to a work or a vocation or anything, I mean, I even think about just you know, giftings that have been given to people to serve the church and help in a, a bodily sort of corporate body sense of, you know, building up the church and, and its purposes and its outworkings. And I mean, we've even used the Exodus passage in the, in the building of the structure, building of the temple, but just in the way that, you know, you're extroverted, you know, the way you have conversation with people flows very easily. You know, there's, you would probably have a more natural proclivity towards evangelism and, you know, doing the conversational style or some, the more sort of quieter personalities might be probably hospitality or, or, uh, service in some sense. But, you know, those, even thinking about how those relate to what you're writing about, I think, would serve people so well. So it's, it's not really just for the high school student, you know, I'm sure it's, it is geared towards them, but it's really for anybody and everybody. And, and, and I'm assuming you would believe that calling changes, not that the calling from God changes, but the, the outworking of that can change uh, as we've kind of talked about before. Absolutely. And I can attest to that through my profession, right? That, you know, in a, my job um, is, is to partner with companies to help them pull people out of one job and into their right. companies. Right. So, so I definitely can profess to the power and the need of, um, of applying your skills to other roles and, and uh, other environments as you go through life. So, so absolutely. And, and to your point, of kind of understanding giftings and personalities, you know, as you know, there are so many assessments out there and I, I work with a lot of them um, because of what I do. Sure. And I w just want to mention here that those can be really, really helpful tools. Yeah. I, I know a lot of people are very, um, 
uh, get get a little cringy about uh, being put in a box or yeah. being you know defined you know too yeah. concretely by certain types of um, personality tests or assessments. Um, I think what that does for all of us is give us gives us words to use yeah. to um, to understand ourselves, to understand other people. And to have a language that um, can help us describe who we are to other people, whether it's on a resume or in a conversation. Um, and it helps us be aware of, of strengths and weaknesses, right? If, yeah, uh, I'll yeah. use a silly little example. I love playing a game on my iPad that's kind of like an interior design game. I'm terrible at it. Like I, I literally am absolutely horrible <laughs> at things with, that are visual. Like my gift yeah. is more, you know, words and people, and and I have hire fun with that. But never hire me <laughs> to decorate your home or to sure. pick out an outfit for you. That's right. just not the the gift that God's given me. And I didn't need an assessment to tell me that, but um, but it can be helpful for for people to recognize. Okay, this is this is what I'm good at. Like I enjoy it. And I thought I was good at it. I really am, you know, so, so it can help give direction as well as help give us words to use in our conversations yeah. with other people. And um, as I mentioned earlier in those overlapping Venn diagram circles, yes, um, right. opportunities, that's one of the circles. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Gifts and opportunities and um, interests, interest, yeah. those change, your yeah. interests change, your dreams change over the course of a life. And mm. um, so I think it's, it's good to, to hold loosely, not to say, okay, this is what God has called me to, and I'm going to stick to this yeah. like white on rice for the rest of my life. You got to hold it loosely and say, okay, right now, my first job out of college was marketing. I loved marketing. I was great at marketing and God changed me over into executive recruiting. Mm. And I love executive <laughs> recruiting. And uh, that just happens to be where I've stayed for 20 years, but that application can change. And you just got to, as with all things in life, hold your hands open and submit it to the Lord and yeah. say, Lord, anytime, anywhere, however you want to do it, I am yours. Use me for the glory of God and the life of the world. Mm, that's wonderful. Aaron Johnson, the book is The Caller, The Called, The Calling, A Hundred Day Guide to Understanding Purpose. Did I get the subtext, right? That was okay. great. Subtitle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this has been really a helpful conversation and I do hope that people will take the time to find the book. Um, we'll have links for those things uh, in the show notes and um, read it together with a group. And if you've got young adults, buy it for them, give it as a graduation gift. And um, I hope that it does help people. Aaron, thank you so much for being on Candid Conversations. Thank you for having me. Candid is a podcast from Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef. Don't forget to connect with our social media pages on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And subscribe to Candid Conversations on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. While there, please leave a review. It helps people find us. As always, thank you for listening to and sharing this episode.